Okay, so welcome everybody to part two of our crowdfunding for civic change series. Um, this uh, is the second part in a two part series. The first one was last week, hosted by Cara on uh, strategy and planning. This second part's gonna be more about tools and tips. So I'm gonna go over a couple of the tools that you might be using uh, during your crowdfunding campaign, including um, including uh, you know the crowdfunding platforms themselves and some communication tools, uh, and then tips for how to choose them and, and how to use them effectively. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm Derek Kalin. Uh, again, uh, I'm one of the innovation specialists on the Innovation for Change Helper Hub, and I focus on technologies and processes. I'm joined by Cara. Do you want to introduce yourself, Cara? Sure, yeah, I'm one of the other innovation specialists and I focus a lot on strategies and Derek and I work together with the different um, hubs, uh, helping them both technical and the strategic part. So we're gonna be covering, uh, as I mentioned, the tools of crowdfunding, including platforms and communication tools. I'll share, I'll share a few more resources. We can do a QA and a session. And if there's time and interest, I'd love to also show you uh, how, how to set up a campaign using a popular crowdfunding website. It's it's fairly simple. Um, so without any further ado, let's get started. Okay, so the, the information that I'm going to be presenting in this session uh, comes from two different sources. One is personal experience. I, I helped run two small campaigns uh, using a crowdfunding pl platform called Generosity, uh, which was made by Indiegogo. Uh, they were for projects um, like helping young women in India uh, raised funding uh, after a fire so they would be able to rebuild their homes and, and you know continue their technology studies the other one was a very small uh, dollar uh, uh, request to like uh, fund a young man from a conflict zone to come to a game development conference and share his his model of games for peace building uh, this also comes from a uh, research this presentation also pulls from research by the middle east and north africa hubs and the south asia hub and our own research um basically mina f did a report on crowdfunding south asia did a research project on uh crowdfunding as a part of their sustainability plan and the helper hub basically merged the platforms that they found in their research and uh deepened the research a little bit so that it could all end up on uh, the innovationforchange.net website, the um, digital toolbox. So that's where a lot of this information comes from. Okay, without any further ado, let's get into crowdfunding platforms. So the interesting thing about platforms uh, for crowdfunding is that oftentimes people think that they are the most important decision that you can make, um, that they come first and foremost. Uh, and in reality, while there are hundreds of different platforms out there, uh, in some ways, the platform doesn't actually matter. Um, you know, people people look at Kickstarter and say, wow, it's the biggest platform out there, but and, and assume that maybe they need to get onto the big platforms because that's where all the eyeballs are. But in reality, um, and I, from my own personal experience and, and from the research, um, you'll find that the sources of traffic, the people who actually view your campaign, don't actually primarily come from the platform. Um, it, it, you are far more likely to get traffic from uh, quote unquote earned media. Uh, so you're direct messaging to other people, sharing it on social media. Some people actually have a budget for advertising, which is interesting, um, or coverage by traditional media outlets, blogs and, and newspapers and things like that. And it's only after all these sources come in and your campaign starts to trend um, that you get eyeballs from the platform itself. So it's something to bear in mind when, when developing your strategy. And really, ultimately, the platform choice that you have should come after your strategy. That's why when Cara and I were planning this, we, we structured everything around the strategy first and then the tools to carry out the strategy second. So after Derek, you- sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I believe that uh, Nyanda has his um, hand raised. I'm not oh. sure if that's intentional. Go ahead. If you have a question, please go ahead and ask it now. But that might have been also the pressing of the wrong button. Anyway, okay. Well, just wanted I, to give you a heads up. Thank you. Now, to feel free to to jump in uh, in case you do have a question. Um, so um, mm -hmm. let's get to 
factors to consider. So there are a number of, uh, after you have crafted your strategy, there are a number of things that you can do, uh, 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 factors you can consider when choosing your platform. They include donor motivation, platform themes, method of payments, whether there's a platform fee and a country focus. And I'm gonna dive into to each of these. Donor motivation is one of the most important elements of choosing your crowdfunding platform, because as it turns out, um, there are two major camps uh, for crowdfunding website. Um, there are two major types of uh, motivations to contribute to a crowdfunding ca campaign and two schools of thought about how to, to cater these things. So those are rewards-based uh, campaign websites and donation-based campaign websites. Rewards-based campaign websites are what you often think about in terms of like traditional crowdfunding platforms, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Patreon. The idea is that it, it assumes that the contributor for your campaign is giving to get something back, right? So you give something to a Kickstarter campaign in order to get an early version of the product or to get a piece of merchandise or to visit the studio, right? So the pitch with rewards-based campaigns is that this is a great product for you to consume, generally speaking. Um, as Cara mentioned, there are a couple of different types of re uh, rewards-based campaigns. Uh, there's uh, one where you get a, quote, reward, so like a one-time gift of a digital asset or a physical piece of merchandise or an action. And then there's equity, where you can actually like invest in the company that's creating the product and you have a share in uh, its profits or <laughs> or lack of profits uh, as it goes forward. Um, so I contributed to a crowdfunding campaign uh, earlier this month uh, for a video game. Um, there's a, a video game called Homeworld, uh, which came out in the 1990s. I love it. It's big, you know, real-time strategy, ship-to-ship -ship combat. It's very pretty and very, very sci-fi. Um, and this is what their, their crowdfunding page looked like. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's a list of um, options on, on the side about uh, rewards that you can get if you um, provide funding to the campaign. So um, I paid $50 and I will get a, a copy of this, this new game when it comes out uh, in, a, in a couple of years for a, a slight discount from the, the normal selling price. But people could have given $60 to get the game plus the back catalog of uh, this company. You could get $100 to get a, a special edition, $1,000 to get, um, you know, this, this signed book uh, with all the art from the, the game series. Uh, and you can see that, like, a lot of this, this page is dedicated towards telling the, the, the contributor, this is what you can get if you uh, support a campaign. You can also see that there's a little button up top, or in addition to buying something, you can also invest, which is quite interesting. Right, so that is a, an example of a rewards-based campaign. Generally speaking, rewards-based campaigns are best suited for products, for um, uh, pieces of media, for, for um, assets that can then be sold, because you will have, through the work of your, your campaign, you will have resources to give back to the community. But bear in mind, uh, and this is uh, harking on something that uh, Cara mentioned in her talk, it's very, very important that you budget for all of this. Um, I've, I've read a bunch of horror stories online of people who uh, promised, uh, over-promised for their rewards for their backers in order to try to encourage people to give to their campaigns, and they ended up promising more in rewards than they actually gave had in their total budget for their, their project. So that's why, as Cara mentioned, having a budget available and showing it to people shows that you've thought through your, your effort and that you, uh, you know exactly what you're going to do with the money that you receive. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's rewards-based campaigns. By contrast, donation-based campaigns make other assumptions about the nature of, of their contributor, what it is that their motivation is. They basically assume that a contributor uh, is giving in order to make some positive good in the world, and they're not expecting a uh, material return on their investment. Right. Um, so here's an example of a, um, a donation based campaign posted on GoFundMe. Um, there is a woman who uh, recently was laid off from her job and therefore was 
um, uh, she fell behind on paying her bills and her rent, and therefore was evicted from her house in this terrible, vicious cycle. And the organizer of a campaign said, help me raise money to get this woman and her two kids back into um, an apartment and prepay their bills for a few months so the woman is able to apply for jobs and, and sustain herself. Um, so very clearly, you're not getting something out of this except the knowledge that you are helping somebody, that you are, you are causing some positive good in the world. And you can see that the construction of this donation-based campaign looks a little bit different, right? On the right-hand side, you don't have rewards that you might give. You, instead, you have a list of donations that people have made. And uh, that's because rewards-based or donation-based campaigns um, have a focus on making people feel like they're part of a movement to help something good in the world happen. And that's what they dedicate the real estate of their, their campaign type for. So the pitch for a donation-based campaign, rather than this is a great product for you to consume, is that this is a great cause or project for you to support. And those are two very different mentalities, two very different natures for a campaign. So. Uh, I'm talking in, in generalities, there's some overlap, there are some rewards-based websites and campaigns that um, do social good, and there's some donation-based campaigns where people end up getting a little bit back from their experience. But generally speaking, uh, these are the two different camps that you might fall into. Um, now, these two different types of platforms also have a slightly different structure to them, um, which you have to bear in mind. With rewards-based campaigns, they're generally uh, they operate under a model called all or nothing. Basically, you say, in a month, I'm going to raise $10,000. And if you don't get commitments from 10,000, uh, like worth $10,000 from all of your audience, um, you don't get the money, right? Uh, the, the, mean, the, the reason for this is that generally speaking with uh, rewards-based campaigns, they try to minimize the risk for contributors. So, um, you know, people don't want to give money if, the cause isn't going to add, if the product isn't going to get made. Uh, by contrast, if you go to a donation-based campaign, generally speaking, they, they operate under a keep it all model. So if you say, I'm gonna earn $10,000 for the social good cause, and you only earn $5,000, generally speaking, you get to keep the 5,000. Uh, because the assumption is that you're trying to support a campaign that's doing social good, and maybe people can do some good with that 5,000 rather than the 10,000, generally speaking. Um, Rewards-based campaigns tend to set a time limit. They say you have 30 or 60 days to like make your uh, make your your goal. Um, whereas with donation-based campaigns, I've seen more and more of them be unlimited uh, than with rewards-based campaigns. But actually, this distinction isn't so great because, as Cara can tell you, usually you get your funding within the the 30 or 60 day period. I think the average duration of a crowdfunding campaign is like 40 days. So um, even though you have an unlimited window, most likely your campaign is going to take place over a similar, similar time frame. And then generally speaking, rewards-based campaigns, they're just interested in getting money. That's what they're designed for. And while most donation-based websites uh, take money, uh, in the research, I also found uh, examples of people, uh, in addition to doing crowdfunding, doing crowdsourcing using these platforms. Uh, and you can crowdsource volunteer effort or, or um, the time of, of different workers. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, the campaigns that I ran were donation based. So uh, people were giving money to a cause and they ended up not getting uh, anything back from it except for handwritten thank you notes and recognition by the, the beneficiaries of the fund. Okay, so that's donor motivation and it's, it's a big uh, thing to, to focus on, but you can also focus on platform themes. Um, platform themes are basically the categories of action inside a platform that people can contribute to. And some platforms tend to try to be uh, as broad as possible in their themes, um, while saying, you know, we, we're a project for creatives, but within that window, there's a big open uh, set of categories. So this word cloud that you see, uh, I, I pulled from the research of a bunch of different, um, the, the MENA hub and the South Asia hub, and looked at all the categories for the, quote, general purpose uh, crowdfunding websites. And this is the word cloud that emerged, right? So you can see that there's a lot of different uh, types of things that show up on these general purpose websites. 
food, technology, education, film, invention, business, journalism, welfare. You know, there's a bunch of, um, it's, it's a very broad uh, set of categories that people can fit inside. Um, by contrast, there are other crowdfunding platforms that distinctly call themselves social good, right? And you can see that the categories that emerge from these platforms are a little bit more narrowly focused on social good activities, right? So health, social entrepreneurship, education, uh, LGBTQI, agriculture, women, disaster, right? So there are sites that specifically focus on categories about helping people um, that uh, while being broad about the ways that you help people are generally about that, right? And then you can go even more focused and find websites that are specifically focused towards one particular category, like for example, health. And the, the categories are pediatric, general, chest, oncology, right? Um, that, this last example comes from a website called Transparent Hands, which is an interesting website because it is 100% uh, focused on um, uh, raising funds for people who have fallen through the cracks of healthcare systems, right? Uh, but it's also entirely focused on people inside Pakistan. So that's another kind of focus that exists out there on platforms, which is country focus. Um, another example of country focus is um, Fundafund, uh, which is a, a crowdfunding platform just for South Africa, right? Um, and the idea with websites that focus just on a particular country is that the community that you're you're trying to get funds for, your audience, is from that particular country. So for example, if we're, you know, if I wanted to put on a um, music conference in South Africa or a, 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 um, a festival of some sort of South African music where it's all South African bands and whatnot, most likely the community that I'm trying to target is based in South Africa. And that's the value of a country focused website. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the theme or country focus may matter if your audience wants to give more for a cause or a country focus. Um, the other reason that a, that a, a narrowly focused website matters is because uh, sometimes uh, they build these websites for a particular context. Uh, and, and that can include um, how people pay for things in a given context. So some of the um, platforms that emerged from our research specifically focused on India or Pakistan or the or places in Nina where the a much of the audience that would be contributing to a campaign gives by means of something other than, you know, international credit cards or PayPal. Some people don't have credit cards or PayPal and they want to contribute to a campaign anyway. So websites have developed ways to uh, collect, con uh, collect contributions through cash or mobile money transfers or e-money transfers. Right. Um, as the crowdfunding space deepens and grows, you know, uh, crowdfunding has been around for more than a decade now. Uh, as this space matures, there are more and more ways for uh, crowdfunding campaigns to like focus on specific economies, uh, which is a really interesting nature of the space. Um, another thing to bear in mind are uh, potential platform fees. Um, fees are what the platform and Cara covered this before. Um, Fees are what the platform charges in return for using uh, the, the platform to host your campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, uh, they run about uh, 5%. Um, it can go up, it can go down. Um, and that's 5% of the, the total contributions that you get from uh, crowdfunding, uh, from all your contributors. Uh, oftentimes, or usually, uh, these campaigns, uh, the, the platforms also include a two or 3% surcharge to cover the cost of credit card transfers. So even if you go to a platform which totally waives the platform fee, like GoFundMe, um, you will still have to pay 3%, maybe 30 cents extra per transaction to cover the cost of moving money from point A to point B. So uh, you can also see platforms that go up to 20%. Uh, but usually you're getting something, you're getting more bang for your buck. Um, you're getting uh, a consultation, somebody who will help you to construct your uh, plat, uh, your campaign, guide you around the corners, prompt you to do certain things. Um, and you have to decide for yourself whether it's worth it. 
right? So those are a, a lot of different factors to consider when choosing your <laughs> your your platform. Now you'll notice. Derek, oh, and and Derek, yeah. Derek, quick question: um, Are you going to also cover um, setting up your own website to collect to do your own crowdfunding, or is that is that something that we can bring up? Uh, so I had hoped to do that towards the end if there was okay. interest from uh, the community here. So like okay. after I go through the presentation, I can spin up, um, you know, and show you what it looks like to do a, a GoFundMe campaign. You can see it's a right. pretty, it's a pretty simple thing. Yeah, I was just going to add like there is another option that if you want to set up your own campaign out not using any of these platforms because you want to avoid those fees you can actually do that as well, right? Um, that's something I brought up in the first webinar is that I did a campaign just throwing up an instance of WordPress and adding a PayPal plugin. And I was able to just collect um, donations that way without having to go through any of these platforms and to deal with any of those um, charges. Uh, you do still have to deal with um, the PayPal fees as well or the transaction the, the method of payment that you're using so there is an alternative alternative way to do it but as Derek's saying the the benefits with these platforms is they bring you uh you know just crowds of people because they have such huge amount of clicks um per day and they're also providing different services so just right. wanted to bring that up as an as an other option yeah yeah thank you Cara yeah so it, you kind of have to you know again go according to your strategy like if you find yourself uh with a lot of technical resources or even you know you feel like you can work your way around a wordpress website then it might be you might want that extra control and that extra customization option that building your own platform provides you if instead you want to like leverage pre-existing assets and you know you're willing to make your peace with the the different fees out there then leveraging a pre-existing uh crowdfunding website is might be helpful to you. So there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to plug innovationforchange.net, <laughs> um, where uh, we've we put a lot of resources around crowdfunding uh, on on our website, and we put the different tools that were highlighted by network members on our digital toolbox. So if you're interested, take a look. You'll notice that I haven't like particularly flagged any individual. Um, uh, crowdfunding website and that's because like there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of platforms out there like the the space is very rich and very saturated at this point um, and that's a good thing like you have a lot of options to choose from it makes it a little bit difficult to to narrow things down I will say that um, I I have in the research that I've done um, GoFundMe seems to be a very a compelling case for uh, a platform. Uh, like I said, there's um, there's a 0% fee. Uh, they they actually ask for additional contributions from the donors themselves. So the the money comes from the donor, not from the um, not from the sum total of the campaign. And GoFundMe has apparently been on a on an acquiring binge. So a lot of the sites that I knew about or used in the past have actually been acquired by GoFundMe. Uh, I, I think they're trying to be the primary social good uh, crowdfunding campaign out there. And they've got resources and, and assets to, to show from it. Uh, and I've Derek, used it. It's fairly helpful. Yep. We got what we have a few questions. Ooh. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> Are you ready? Um, yes. So um, Nyanda has two questions. Um, he says, I'm interested in the, the Patreon platform. Do you have any good samples of nonprofits using Patreon? I also believe there's a reward platform, but is it also ongoing? Yes. And okay, the, so the second question is about trust. So let me know when you're ready for that one. Let me let me take the first one. Um, so Patreon is an interesting model. Um, it Patreon is uh, a website is is a crowdfunding platform uh, that bills itself for um, creatives producing media content. So you often see Patreons tied to YouTube um, uh, channels or to podcast episodes. You are basically becoming a patron in the classical sense of a producer of work. Um, and as such, it's not a one-time donation, but like um, a monthly subscription. Usually, you know, 
you know, people often ask for like $1 or $2. Uh, there are other examples of people using Patreons that are not contra uh, content providers. So for example, I subscribe to a, um, an open source social media network and I provide um, a dollar a month to um, the, the person who is taking on the administrative tasks of, of hosting the server. Um, I don't know of any examples of people doing this for nonprofits, but it, it isn't impossible. Um, but yes, it is, a, it is a reward platform that is um, ongoing as opposed to a one-time contribution. Okay, so building trust. Um, so Nayanda was saying, I believe it is, building trust I believe is one of the main characteristics of a good campaign. Do you have any good examples of how a campaign has built trust to raise funds? Yeah, um, I wish that this site was still online. Uh, this example was still online, but unfortunately, the generosity platform has gone offline. But there are a number of ways that you can do it that this, this campaign uh, worked on. Um, one, you can see here that the person uh, provided a picture of his face and his name and uh, organization. Um, so that instead of giving to like a faceless entity, you could look at somebody on the campaign and say, oh, this is an individual that I'm giving to. Two, you include in the narrative of your campaign, both in the video presentation and in the text, um, instances of why, like a description of why you care, why this matters for you. Um, so in the case of um, Nauni, who was the, you know, the, the face of the campaign and the, the organizer based in India, um, he showed himself with the recipients of funding. He showed himself at the site of the, the place of the fire saying like this, <laughs> one proving that the cause was real, right? He was on site showing the, the issues that happened uh, and also explaining his history, working with these young women, explaining how he has done things in the past. So simply describing these things can help people understand that you are uh, a, a real person and, and not a scam artist. Um, oftentimes, uh, platforms insist that contributions, um, or they don't insist, but they often recommend that you give, um, you, you say that the beneficiary of the funds is a nonprofit rather than an individual, because people are more likely to trust an institution that you can look up online and see uh, what it is, right? Um, you can see its history of supporting uh, causes like this in the past, right? So there are a number of ways that you can make the campaign um, address some of the concerns that people have when contributing to a campaign. But you're right, trust is, is a difficult thing, especially for people who are unfamiliar with uh, crowdfunding platforms in general, um, which is another reason why sometimes people do country focus. Um, because if you see a bunch of examples on the platform from um, your specific country context, uh, you may have, you, the contributor, might be more likely to contribute to a campaign. So there are a number of ways that you can try to build trust. Usually it involves um, communicating more and, and telling a story more to your potential contributor. Okay. So, thank you uh, for these questions. These are, these are great questions. Um, oh, uh, I also wanted to mention, Carl, there is an example of somebody within the network using Facebook to gather funds, right? Yes, actually, it's a really good question. Uh, or good, thank you for jogging my memory. I was, <laughs> it came up during the first session that I forgot to include it. We had someone from, and I don't know if Far, I don't think Far is on the call, but um, when we were out in Tajikistan, uh, we had someone in Bakhtor City um, who told us that they had gone to one of our innovation labs um, and crowdfunding had come up. And he did his own crowdfunding campaign using Facebook causes. And they were able to fundraise. Uh, we have that video um, in Russian, which we're going to put up on the platform at some point. Uh, and, and he was saying that he had. Um, gathered thousands for what was the equivalent of, of a public ballpark. And they were able to do it in a pretty short period of time. He said it was about a couple of weeks and they were very successful at doing that. 
Awesome. So that's that's another example of an in-network crowdfunding campaign. And we have an ambition to get this in our innovations gallery. So you can see it as a as a case study example. Uh, and probably Facebook um, causes needs to end up in the digital toolbox as well. So that's a note for me. Um, OK, so in the second part, I want to talk a little bit about the other tools that you might need to use in your crowdfunding campaign and uh, a couple of tips for 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 using them. Um, so a lot of your campaign is not so much about the platform, but reaching out to an audience with an ask. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, the audience is uh, basically the people you are asking to support your campaign. And you can imagine a series of concentric circles, right? At the very center are friends and family, people you know personally. And there's a broader circle of like your colleagues and broader community. And then there are communities that you don't necessarily belong to, but are interested in the thing that your campaign is about, focused on your theme or issue. And then another really important audience uh, member are like media organizations. Uh, there are other examples, but these are, these are some of the core groups that you might be considering targeting as your audience for your campaign. Um, your ask is, what is it that you are asking people to do to support your campaign? And generally speaking, you're asking two things. You're asking people to contribute directly to your campaign and then share the campaign with your networks. And it's the second one that is so important. Um, you know, crowdfunding, the big, <laughs> the big uh, significance of crowdfunding is that we are moving away or, or is a different model. Instead of asking a single donor for a lot of money, we're asking many, many donors for a small amount of contributions, right? And in order for a campaign to be successful, you need to leverage networks. So that's why uh, media organizations are so important uh, in your campaign, because they end up uh, actually have coming baked in with a large audience uh, network. So I, I highly recommend including them in your campaign. But one thing that you can do to make it easier for all these different audience members to share your campaign is making it super easy to do. Um, you need to make it so that, um, well, it, look at it this way. Um, if you, you look at uh, uh, online retail companies like Amazon, Amazon has made it very, very easy for people to make a purchase with one click. You know, you press a button on a, on a physical device and it'll make an order. You uh, click buy now with one click uh, on, on the platform, uh, the Amazon platform and it'll make the purchase without giving you a, a, a second chance to, to think it over. And there's a reason that they do this, right? Um, they've done studies on how people make purchases on online websites, and they find that the point, uh, a major point of failure is when people get to their um, uh, shopping cart and see the final bill, and then they think, do I really need to buy you know, uh, that DVD box set of a TV show? Do I need to buy this extra set of shoes, right? Um, so they've developed a system whereby people can just do one click and make a purchase and they don't have to think about it anymore. And you can learn from <laughs> the private sector in this case. Uh, there are uh, one click share websites um, where you can write in uh, a, a, a tweet or something that you think is important um, and put it into uh, these boxes, click create the link and it'll generate a URL for you which you can then uh, hand out to the people inside your network so that they, all they need to do instead of like um, writing something up, ugh, how awful, uh, explaining why they contributed to this campaign, thinking about all the different reasons why they might have contributed, you can just make a link for them to click that loads up a, a sample post on their social network of choice and, and shares it out. Uh, if you're using email, provide people with pre-written copy and images. You can say, please, I've written this, this message for you. Uh, I've given you some images that you can attach and share with your own network. You provide a pre-existing piece of copy. It makes it that much easier for people to uh, cut and paste, put it into their own email client and send it out to their network. So you're reducing the barriers to sharing. It's also important that when you're actually crafting your uh, crowdfunding website, you project the image of a successful, impactful campaign. That's part of the reason why uh, Indiegogo says that, um, you know, it's, it's so important to uh, reach 30% of your goal in the first two days of your campaign. Because if you do all this uh, pre-campaign work, like what Cara was talking about, 
get people to commit to contribute on day one, and then you have this 30% contribution uh, off the bat, then you can turn around to media outlets, then you can turn around to social media, uh, your social media circles, and you say, oh my goodness, look at us. We have, you know, two days in, gotten this explosion of interest. Come on. Uh, people want to contribute to campaigns that they think are going to be successful. Uh, they want to contribute to campaigns that are other people think are exciting. And by structuring your campaign and using your tools creatively, you can create a, a buzz which will, uh, which will make it much more likely that you will have the momentum to carry you across and get your goal. Um, use the platform update feature. And that's another part of projecting this really successful campaign. Um, for all these uh, platform, um, crowdfunding platforms, they give you an option to provide updates to your uh, users. And that, those updates are also viewed by um, people who come to your session. So um, the example I, I gave earlier of a, a GoFundMe campaign where the woman had like, the, the, the organizer was trying to get a woman into uh, a housing complex. They, they continue to provide updates at milestones. Like, yeah, we passed the 90% mark. This is amazing. Look at the impact. The family will move into their new affordable rental tomorrow. This is a great start. Thank you, everybody. Um, somebody coming to this website sees these updates and sees this community coming into place. And they're like, wow, this is something that's impactful. This gets to building trust, right? Because you already have people telling stories of how the money will be used and how it's going to be um, successful. Some people build their campaign around um, uh, developing a content calendar so that they have scheduled updates when funding milestones are reached, when whenever press coverage comes in, that's a big one because press coverage, uh, again, gives a sense of authenticity and trust um, so that people who might be on the fence might say, wow, well, the, it, this was covered by you know, my local newspaper. Uh, maybe this is a real, the real deal. When a large contribution comes in, when a contributor says something inspirational, or even just on a periodic basis, like daily or weekly, um, you can use updates also to ask your contributors to contribute again. You're saying, look, guys, we are at 90% of our milestone or, or of our goal. Do you think you, if everybody who has contributed so far gave another $5, we could meet our goal and be totally successful. And people do that. You are far more likely to get money from somebody who has already contributed than a, a total stranger. So the people who have given might be able to give again and push you over in your, your goal. When you are doing your social media and email outreach, ask directly and specifically for contributions. Uh, it, this was a big barrier for me. I, I tend to not like to be <laughs> so direct when I ask people for things. And oftentimes I'm like, oh, well, you know, whatever you can do. But scientifically, it's been proven. Like if you are direct and specific about your ask, people are more likely to accomplish. So instead of saying, please do what you can, say, would you contribute $50 to our campaign? And even if people can't make $50, they will try to give what they can. And $50 might give a sense of how ambitious they should be, right? Instead of uh, take a look and see what you think, say, would you please share this with 10 contacts directly and post it with your lar larger social networks? Ultimately, people are more likely to do what you ask, what you want them to do if you ask them directly to do it. Um, so something to bear in mind there. Uh, and don't forget video. Video is crucial in all of this. Um, as we mentioned in the, uh, in the previous session, uh, campaigns with a pitch video raise four times more than campaigns without a pitch video. So think about that. That is the difference between meeting your goal and getting a quarter of your goal. So campaigns are really important. And I think the reason why, or videos are really important. And I think the reason why is that generally speaking, people hate to read <laughs> people. Uh, want, especially if they're coming to a website that they weren't expecting to go to, they want to have everything handed to them very, very easily. And our, our simian brains really like getting uh, video and audio delivered to us. Reading is, it tends to be challenging. Also, contributing to a campaign ends up being kind of an emotional decision. You, you see a product that you want and you get excited for it, or you see somebody who needs help and you feel motivated by empathy. 
And video and audio, I mean, it's not to say that you can't do this with text, but video and audio are very powerful ways to motivate people's emotions. So having video, um, you know, that's the reason why it's so crucial. The good news is that you don't need to be, you know, a famous uh, director in order to create a compelling video. Smartphone video can be fine, right? Video done on a cheap camera can be fine. What's important is that you, um, you know, communicate directly with people, that you articulate, uh, you look into the camera and try to say why this matters to you. Um, now, if you want, I've seen examples of people who do one take videos and, you know, as long as they are in the right setting and like the audio isn't, isn't awful, um, you know, you can, you can do a very simple video that's very compelling um, uh, and you don't need to edit at all. Uh, if you have the resources, uh, there are online video editing tools that significantly reduce the barrier to creating a compelling video. If you can create a PowerPoint presentation, you can use some of these tools like WeVideo or Beyond to develop a compelling uh, video to put into to, to your campaign. In general, and I think these rules, uh, you know, Cara is the comms expert, uh, but I have found that these rules uh, have worked for me in the past both for video and for, um, for uh, you know, your written text as well. You explain the problem and why people should care. You explain the solution that you are providing and you explain what impact that solution will have. This woman lost her home. We are going to raise money to get her an apartment and the outcome will be that she and her daughters are no longer on the streets and she will be better able to hunt for a job and care for her family, right? Use faces if you have the consent of the people that you're trying to support. You use human stories, emotions. You use images because you know we're we're a visual people. We enjoy seeing things, and we get a lot of information from images. And ultimately, uh, keep it short and sweet. Um, I I most people say two to three minutes max for a crowdfunding video, just so people get the message uh, in a in a fast way. Cara, I don't know. Would you would you add anything to this if you're creating a pitch video? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just a story, like that, that human face, which is what you've, you've included in here, I think is one of the most important things about your pitch and, and your project. Yeah. Um, so in general, um, and so like I say, most, most crowdfunding videos put, or crowdfunding uh, platforms put the video front and center um, in, in uh, your campaign. So uh, keep that in mind if you're planning your own campaign. So a couple of additional resources, again, the innovationforchange.net digital toolbox, um, uh, Indiegogo's essential guide to crowdfunding. Um, uh, that's where I'm getting a lot of the stats about what makes a successful campaign. They basically did an analysis of the, the hundreds of thousands of campaigns that have been run on their platform and found statistically what was made a campaign more likely to succeed or fail. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, crowdfunding for, uh, that should be civic change, part one, uh, Cara's presentation, in case you missed that first lecture. Uh, so I'll be sure to share this presentation with the group uh, so that you have access to it. And basically what I'm trying to do is, is to get you to go and see the resources that exist on innovationforchange.net. Also not here, but I will update this presentation. Um, I, I wanna link to the research performed by the different regions. Um, so that you'll be able to benefit from their region-specific analysis. Um, so that's, that's it for me. Are there any other questions uh, before, um, you know, we have about 10 minutes left in this presentation, and I'd love to show you uh, what GoFundMe looks like. We don't have any, thank you, Derek. That was a really great presentation. Um, we don't have any other questions yet. Uh, I did type into the chat in case folks can't find their chat. Um, please type in your questions there. And I'll be helping Derek with um, making sure that your questions get addressed. Thank you. Okay, um, let me stop that recording and then switch over to share Firefox. Here we go. All right. Okay, um, I'm gonna show gofundme.com. Um, as I mentioned, GoFundMe 
has a 0% platform fee. It seems to be one of the largest one that uh, like social good um, uh, crowdfunding campaigns out there or crowdfunding platforms out there. Um, they, they are on a, a kick to acquire a lot of different websites. So generosity got purchased, CrowdRise got purchased. Um, and in general, it, it seems to be very, very user-friendly. Uh, I'm going to start a campaign. Derek, quick question. If yeah. they're not charging fees, what is their, how are they making money? How are they sustaining? Uh, good question. So they basically, okay, so if I, the organizer, create a campaign using this interface, um, I never see, I, the only thing that I see come out is the credit card fee. The, the fee for actually processing the money. But if I'm a contributor to a GoFundMe campaign, I ha I'll have two windows for uh, contributing. I wonder if it's possible to show this. Aha, so here it is. Um, I can contribute, you know, $10. And then GoFundMe says, would you consider including a tip of 15%? And then I could like increase it or diminish it. Oh, it's, actually, it's actually really clever on their part because the, the, the typical crowdfunding fee, platform fee, is 5%, but they start with 15%. So they end up getting more from, from donors when they are asking directly. Uh, and the, the donor is not asking on their behalf. It's, it's super interesting. Um, I haven't seen other sites go for this particular model. Mm -hmm. No, it, that's super interesting. It works. It works. Um, Okay, so the first thing that uh, GoFundMe asks you uh, off the bat is your your goal. And you know, if you have followed Caro's advice, you have a budget. You know exactly what your campaign is going to cost. Um, sometimes I have seen people suggest that you increase that amount by like thirty percent to get some padding. Um, but generally speaking, I've always felt that like a nice round number that is exactly what we need works. So say we want ten thousand dollars. Then it asks you for a campaign title, and you can see um, help. Uh, you have a character limit. You need to be short and sweet. Um, a good idea with a crowdfunding campaign is to be very specific about what it is that you're asking for. So don't say like, um, you know, building houses. Uh, you're saying we are help us build a house for community servant Bob, <laughs> or something along those lines. Like the title immediately tells you your objective. It tells you um, that the person you're helping is a good person because they're a community servant. Probably we could do a better job than this, but in, in general, you have to be short and sweet with your, with your title. You uh, can say whether you are building uh, for a nonprofit, here again, uh, developing trust, uh, this largely focuses on uh, U.S.-based things, but if you have an EIN, you can you can get in on it. It's also totally fine to say I'm building this for myself or somebody else. The the website functions pretty much the same. Um, and ag again, like this is an example of what it would be like uh, for a, a website that works inside the U.S. You will go through a very similar experience for more internationally focused websites as well. Most of them will ask you for your location in some way. This is, I think, part of their algorithm. So they know uh, they can present people with um, projects from your community, but it also helps them in their stats. So they know who is raising money for what, right? Uh, and you can also name uh, your category. So in the case of GoFundMe, um, you know, we're gonna say community and neighbors. And GoFundMe specifically, gives you a choice about whether you want to be an individual or a team. Um, and here they, uh, they explain their transaction fee. So 2.9% uh, plus 30 cents per donation. Okay, cool. I'll give my own zip code in order to move forward here. I'm in Rockville, Connecticut for people who care. Now, they will want you to integrate your account with Facebook. And they do this for a number of reasons. One, they get more user data about the people who are using their platform. So it, it helps them learn their business model or learn about their, their audience and users more. But also, um, you know, 
the assumption is that one of the primary venues for your um, campaign uh, to be shared is going to be on Facebook. So it, it allows you to share directly on your Facebook account through GoFundMe if you give it permissions. Uh, you can upload a photo or you can add a YouTube video. So here's where your YouTube video comes into play. Um, I'm going to just pick a random YouTube video. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Harry, Potter, <laughs> Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. What is this game? Um, will be my. YouTube video. I'll say, are you sure you want this to be it? And I say, yes. And then it says, tell your story. And you can see, uh, like Cara said, like the story is what's important. Uh, you raise it and it gives you prompts on what should be involved. Describe who will benefit. Detail what the funds will be used for. Describe how soon you need the funds. Talk about what the support will mean to you, how grateful you will be. All of these things make a compelling story. People want to contribute to compelling stories. And you can see that it's a pretty simple interface. Um, uh, you can bold stuff, you can link to stuff, you can add pictures and video. Honestly speaking, um, okay, let's see if it'll, it'll let me do this. Um, I'm going to, you have to be careful here uh, because one thing about GoFundMe is there's no, they, they reduce the, the barrier uh, so much that you, it'll go pretty forward uh, fast to like publishing your story. Um, I'm moving forward. Let's see if it'll let me go forward. Campaign is ready. Okay, so the campaign is live. I've got to take this down now. <laughs> but let's show the steps that it, it asks you to go through. When I click next, it says, okay, add your Facebook photo. Uh, adding your photo gives supporters confidence that a real person created the campaign. Your photo is important, so if you don't do it, it will bug you to do it and say, okay, we'll never post on your account unless you say so. We're gonna skip again. Okay, now it's gonna say, email your friends, and it'll ask to connect with Gmail. Here again, the company is trying to get data from you. Uh, they want your contacts list. Um, they're doing it for a good cause. They're doing it in order to um, facilitate um, your, um, your communications campaign. I tend to prefer to manage my campaign directly. Um, uh, so it, it's up to you how you want to go, but you can integrate your Gmail account if you want. You can post to Facebook. Sharing on Facebook can increase donations by three times. So it gives you all these prompts that digitally tells you these are the different ways that you can improve your campaign. Uh, ask close friends to share. Again, it integrates with Facebook and you can compose a message that way. I wouldn't just go through Facebook. I would go through email channels or Twitter or whatever, like face-to-face -face conversations even, what a thought. Um, there are a number of ways that you can go about doing this, but the point is asking to share. Post it on Twitter and then take your link and share it. So that is what a crowdfunding campaign looks like. And I am real quick going to attempt to, to cancel this, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point and in the few minutes that we have remaining, open this up for questions uh, or comments. And if there aren't any questions or comments, I'm curious, are, are people considering running a campaign on their own? And if so, what about? We have a shy group, I think, here, Derek. So we don't have any questions yet. Okay. All right, my campaign was deactivated. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, I will not be taking money from people. Well, all right. Cara, is there anything that you want to add in, in the final minutes that we have here? Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, you covered most of it. The only thing I want to say is that with the strategy part as part is how you use YouTube um, and the social media, just make sure that say, you know, they ask you and GoFundMe, that was incredibly fast compared to other sites that I've used. But you know, they'll ask you things like headline and like, you know, the text for your story. Just make sure to be consistent across the board in all your social media. Um, so really think about it. Like, for example, the headline is usually what, um, when someone does a Google search, it's what the spiders will scrape so that they'll actually be looking specifically 
for those keywords. So really some thought into um, like what your headline is and then uh, in your video cross post so that you could actually in your video description put in the same description you use in the GoFundMe or the platform that you're using and then put a link in your YouTube description to your, to your funding campaign so that you're across the board just consistent, right? And you have a brand for that campaign. That's a really important um, thing to, to really keep in mind. Uh, Ekaterina mentions that uh, they've been thinking for a while to run a campaign to fund the rescue of victims of human trafficking. Uh, but for some reason or another, we haven't done it. Yeah, uh, and that's a challenging campaign to run. Uh, to, to, to run. Um, like creating a communication strategy will be pretty challenging with that, um, especially if you want to like tell human stories about people. And yeah, ever thinking about video, we cannot use the victims, for example, to make the video and build trust. Exactly. Um, one, one example that I, I've seen other people do is that you might give an, have an interview with uh, somebody who has been rescued or has like come back from, from that life. And they can explain their own experiences saying like, you know, I'm not one of the beneficiaries of, of this campaign, but I know what the people who would benefit from this campaign are feeling because this was my life. This is how I felt. Um, so sometimes you can use a proxy for telling the story. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, if, if somebody knows intimately about the experience, um, you know, you yourself can be the person in front of the camera saying like, I have seen people who have gone through these particular challenges. I have talked with people who tell me about their problems. Um, and so if you can't get the recipient of the funding or a proxy for the recipient of the funding, then you, the organizer who are motivated by this can tell your story. Like, why do I care? Why do I think this is important? What do I hope to accomplish? Um, but you're right, it is, it's an incredibly challenging task. So, um, you know, please, please do let us know if you end up going about it. We'd, we'd love to support if we can. Definitely. Okay, <laughs> that's good to hear. Okay, everybody, we're at the hour mark. Uh, so uh, unless there are any questions, I think uh, I'll wrap it up here. Um, thank you again for, for coming to these sessions. And thank you for coming to this one if you weren't able to make uh, the first one. Car and I are going to make sure that both of these are available on innovationforchange.net uh, as activity reports and, and webinars. Um, so you should be able to access them after the fact. Um, and yeah, thank you for taking the time to learn about this experience and, and let us know, please let us know if you end up adding this uh, to your sustainability strategy. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.